Security, that's someone else's job. Lean data practices, privacy by design, these concepts, they sound great in theory, but how can I actually apply them in a way that doesn't affect our users' experience or doesn't hinder our innovation efforts? Welcome to our Lean Data Practices class, where you will learn practical ways to apply our Lean Data Practices framework in the product management context in a way that still keeps your customers at the center. Today, we'll start first with providing a quick overview of lean data, practice, lean data practices and their benefits. We'll then dive deeper into how to apply each of the LDP principles in the product management context. And lastly, I'll leave you with our website and a downloadable toolkit that you can use for your company. So what are lean data practices? Lean data practices or LDP is a flexible framework that anyone can use to stay lean and be smart about how they collect data in their organization. Through LDP, you're then able to build trust with your customers. Now there are three pillars to lean data practices. Our first is engage your audiences. Now this is about transparency and being open with your customers so that they understand how you're using their data, what you're doing, who you're sharing it with, and are empowered to make the decisions that are best for them. Our second pillar is to stay lean. And this one is all about data minimization and only collecting data that delivers value. And our third and final pillar is to build in security. And this is all about protecting the data that you have. Now, there are many benefits to lean data practices. Through LDP, you are able to build and develop trust with your customers. Now, this trust comes from many different ways. The trust that you build with your customers comes from easy to understand explanations and a well-designed user interface that the customers can use to uh, exercise their choices in an easy and not confusing manner. It also comes from explanations that are not only clear, but also well-timed in the location that your customer would expect uh, to see those explanations. The trust comes from transparency and being open with your users around how their data is being used and the fact that you are minimizing their, the data of theirs that you are using. If you have other business partners that you, of course, trust with the user's data, you want to be transparent and build that trust with your customers because you've explained to them why they should trust them too and that you've done your due diligence uh, before deciding specific business partners to partner with. The trust also comes from helping your customers to understand that their data is protected within your organization. And lastly, because issues inevitably do happen, Trust comes when you resolve those issues swiftly and when you handle them honestly. Now, LDP also helps you to uh, avoid untrustworthiness. Now, this comes from collecting user data without explaining to them what you're collecting or getting their permission or helping them to understand how you're going to be using the data, especially if it's in a way that they otherwise would not be expecting. The untrustworthiness also comes when the user interface is confusing for your customers and designed in a way that is difficult for them to really take control over their data. We also see untrustworthiness when human errors inevitably arise and our customers' credentials or their data is exposed. And also when the product is 
designed uh, without privacy in mind. And so it was engineered from the beginning in a manner that resulted in the leakage of data. And then lastly, the untrustworthiness comes from how you handle uh, situations that do arise uh, when the uh, issues happen. And if data breach headlines that implicate you or your business partners put your company's name at the forefront, while the untrustworthiness is going can come from that and can impact your brand. But of course, it's all about how you bounce back from that and how you handle those types of situations. So let's dive deeper into lean data practices in the product management context. We'll start with our first principle of engaging your audiences. Remember, this one's all about transparency. Our first tip is to identify your audiences so that you know all of the different stakeholders at play. So who are the audiences for your company, uh, for your product? You have your customers, and that could be in the business to customer setting or the business to business setting. You have your colleagues, engineers, product managers, marketers, sales, legal, all of the different parts of your organization that help to make it a success. You have your leadership and you have your investors. Perhaps you're like Mozilla and you have specialized communities that contribute to your success, that are invested in your success, and that because they're so specialized, you engage with them in a different manner compared to how you would the general audience. You also have your business partners and your clients. And then lastly, you have the general public's uh, perception of, of your brand. While all of these different audiences are important, today's presentation will primarily focus on number one, your customers. Our second tip is that when it comes to sensitive issues or things that people would find surprising, remember to engage early and be very clear so that you're reducing the chance for them to be surprised by what they're hearing, especially if it's related to something that they were not otherwise expecting. Here's an example from the Mozilla context within our Firefox browser. If I am a user of Firefox and I see recommended by pocket, I might start to think recommended recommendations. Are these recommendations based off of my browsing history? Are these based off of an algorithm? and I didn't know that they were using my data in this way. If a user starts to have that concern though, they can click quickly click learn more to understand how we are actually making those recommendations and rest easy knowing that it's not based on their, their data and that we still care about their privacy. On the right side though, perhaps the user is still not interested in having these recommendations. Well, they can then take action to remove the section or just hide it if they don't mind it being there, but they just don't want to look at it. Or perhaps they want even more information, and so they can go to the privacy notice to learn more. Here's another example from a privacy notice. It lists out all of the different categories of data that this service is receiving and using. So before a customer engages with this product, they can see all the different types of user data that is, are, that's being collected from their data partners. Perhaps the customer is okay with mobile ad ID or a cookie ID or an email address, but the fact that the service is also collecting age, gender, income, language, purchase data might give them some hesitation. Well, by being transparent with the data that the service is relying on and helping the customer to understand the full breadth of that data, we're helping to avoid surprises and giving them the ultimate choice 
in making the determination of whether or not they want to interact and engage with the service based off the information that they know. Our third tip, and this is speaking of privacy policies, don't solely rely on your privacy notice to provide people with information. Engage where your audience would expect to receive that type of information. So as I mentioned earlier, Mozilla has uh, specialized communities that we engage with. And one of the locations where we engage is via forums. So depending on the type of information you uh, want to convey, find the, you want to find the best location to share that. It could be in a, you know, informational or marketing email. It could be specifically within the product, or it could be in something like a forum where the people that that information applies to know to look and would expect to hear and receive that type of information. Here's another example. This is a sign up screen where someone has to simply enter their mobile number before they uh, continue on with the service. Now, before providing your personal data, you might wonder who all the, who are they going to share my data with? Why do I have to provide this? Well, from the beginning, on the left side, we see we do not share your personal details with anyone. So now customers know before they provide their information that their data is going to stay with this company and it's not going to be shared elsewhere. And they are hopefully more comfortable with then giving their mobile number and continuing with the process. Our fourth tip, engage when it matters. Here's another Firefox example. This is from our Firefox Nightly browser. There was a change where Nightly was now going to be routing DNS requests through a partner service whenever possible. And we wanted to make sure our users knew and understood that. This could have been a blog post, it could have been an email perhaps, but the best place to let people know of that change was when they opened the Nightly browser for the first time after that change was made. And so, we popped up this notification for our individuals. And as we see here, if people are not interested based on what they've heard, they can click disable. And if they're okay and appreciate that we let them know, they can simply click okay, got it, and continue on with their browsing session. Our fifth tip is to say what really matters and give details elsewhere. Remember, People do not want to read a lot, and we only have so much space to give them the information that we want them to know to get them to continue to use our service. Here's a common example that we've all seen in our personal, our personal browsing lives. When someone logs or accesses this, their web, this website, we see a notification pop up asking, Will you allow us to access your location? Now, for some customers that, generally speaking, don't typically like to allow location access, based off of this alone, they can go ahead and say, don't allow and continue on. However, for others that generally do allow, they can say allow and move forward as well. And then for that last group, that may or may not be okay with it, but want to get more information, they can click learn more and read up and on whatever else it is that they need to know, rather than providing all of that information to everybody. And here's an example from our privacy policy. So the left side is what anyone will see when they're looking at the Firefox privacy notice. And this is a section that says, hey, if you use these features listed below, then Firefox will share this data to provide you the functionality and improve our products and services. Rather than bulleting out the information for each one of these, 
we keep it high level so that if someone, for example, doesn't use sync, then they don't need to click and learn more information for, it, for the sync context. Perhaps you do use Firefox accounts though. And so you want to click that plus sign to further understand what that means in the Firefox account context. So if someone clicks the plus sign, the information on the right opens up below the Firefox account subheading, and then they can see the categories of information and brief explanations on what data falls under that category and how it's used. We also see that there are hyperlinks within. So for individuals that do want more information than what was already provided, they can click to read more. Our sixth tip is to give people options if you don't actually need the data. Here's an example from a, an account creation screen for premium membership. We see a variety of data fields listed here from email to name, to password, to phone number, to address, to profession, to annual income. A better option for customers or prospective customers is to let them know which fields are optional or conversely, have the mandatory fields and leave the rest there to give them the choice of whether or not they want to provide that information. To create a premium member's account, perhaps email, name, password, and phone number, and country are, are critical pieces of information. But if state, city, PIN code, profession, and annual income aren't actual requirements, then we should reduce the amount of data that we're collecting from our customers and give them the choice of whether or not they want to provide that additional information since it's not essential to running that service. Our seventh tip, and our, this is our last tip, expectations and behavior patterns change. So remember to reevaluate engagement over time. We're learning this all the time at Mozilla. One example here is when we learned that if we compared the engagement of our Firefox privacy notice link underneath a download now button compared to when the privacy notice tab opens separately, there was a lot more engagement with the tab as opposed to the link. But if you're not reevaluating engagement and continuing to check in, you miss opportunities to imp continuously improve. And so remember to re-engage over time. Another example, cookie banners. We're continuing to hear more and more information about cookie banners and what is the most meaningful way to use them so that our customers don't find them annoying or that so that we can consider the consent received through the cookie banners as valid consent. But if you just provided a cookie banner on your website and went about your days and years without uh, re-engaging or re-evaluating use of the cookie banner and how it was used and what the general public sentiment is, then again, you're missing an opportunity to continue to improve and ensure that you're reaching your customers in the best way possible. So let's recap. Here are some tips for improved audience engagement. First, provide timely and contextual in-product communications through the use of things like permission panels, overlays, onboarding tours, and other features that are user-friendly and taking advantage of your UI in a meaningful way for your customers. Give your customers choice within the product through things like unchecked boxes or optional fields or accessible controls so that they really are empowered to make the decision uh, that they want to make and not that they're forced to make. If you have specialized audiences, communicate to them through places like forums, blogs, or bugs. We'll talk about our bug bounty, bug bounty program a little bit later. 
And lastly, remember to reevaluate your engagement over time. Let's talk now about our second principle, stay lean. Remember, this one's all about data minimization. Now, our first tip is to stop collecting what you do not need. And here's an example. If you access the Common Voice website, anybody that accesses it can immediately start to use their microphone to speak and donate their voice to the program or listen to other voices to validate the accuracy of what it is that they said. There is a login and sign up feature in the top right, but that's not a requirement for using the service. Now, if someone wants to do additional things, access additional features or engage more deeply with us, then they can sign up and create an account. But that's not a requirement from the beginning for, for them to, to use uh, this service. Here's another example. Now here, this company, they're being very transparent before uh, an individual has downloaded their service. They're letting people know the types of data that they do need access to. Now, just like any of us should do within our own roles, we should always look at the data we're accessing and ensure that everything that we're asking for are things that we actually need in order to uh, use the service. Because when we have a lot of data, that also can scare customers because they do feel like they're giving a lot of it away. And so it's helpful for them to understand what it is that uh, we actually need and to only collect that from us. Our second tip is to understand, therefore, what it is that you actually need versus data that you want. Let's revisit the cookie banner talk. So with cookie banners, there are both essential and non-essential cookies. Essential cookies or necessary cookies, these are ones that are required for the website to operate. And so it's essentially mandatory and we don't typically see an opt into those because it's needed for the site to run. Now contrast that to your non essential cookies that might help to personalize the content that your customers see or help you collect statistics or other types of analytics. While those could have benefits to the customer or especially to your business they're not essential and so we don't want to make it mandatory for customers to provide that type of data we need the necessary cookies but we want the preferences the statistics the marketing cookies and so the choice we give to our customers is going to be different between those two groups our third tip is to find your old data and evaluate if you still need it. So I'm going to give you a few questions to think about. When was the last time you looked at the data that you had and considered how old it was? How old is the oldest data that you currently keep? When was the last time that you determined how long you actually need certain pieces of data. Perhaps you originally collected it thinking you needed it for five years, but you realize you stop using it after six months. Or when was the last time that you looked at the data that you were collecting and confirmed that you actually were using all of it? Perhaps for account creation, you were asking customers to provide their name, their surname, their email address, but you realize that you only use their email address or you only use their first name and you don't need their surname. 
These are just a few of the questions that you should ask yourself as you're evaluating the data that you have and whether or not you still need it, and of course, how you can improve going forward. Our fourth tip is to evaluate your unverified accounts. And for those unverified accounts, you're going to want to determine how long you need that data. Now, an unverified account happens when a customer or prospective customer completes your form to sign up for the service. You then send an email to them saying, congratulations, one more click and you'll be signed up with us. But they never click that verify or confirm button in the email. And so they sit in your systems as unverified. Do you have that today? And if so, how long do you actually need to keep that type of data? They didn't actually complete the signup process. So short of metrics to understand how many unverified accounts you have, and perhaps looking at that over time, there's not much value in holding on to that type of data because since because they didn't complete the process, you can't fully engage or interact with them. So look at your unverified accounts and determine how long holding on to that type of data is helpful for your company. Our fifth tip is to evaluate your inactive accounts and your unengaged accounts. And again, you're going to want to determine how long you need that data. So these are accounts and customers that signed up for your service and for whatever reason, they're no longer engaging. They're not opening your emails. They're not logging into their account to actually use the product. Uh, they're not opening um, the app. How long do you still need to hold on to the data for folks that haven't used your service in two years, five years, et cetera? So consider uh, after you determine how long you need it, getting rid of that data as well and reducing the amount of data that you're holding on to. Now, when we talk to people about this topic, sometimes it can be scary. They think, oh, if we get rid of our customer's data, you know, that's a bad user experience for them. How will they know? What if they later change their mind and then they realize that we got rid of them? So I'll show you two examples now of meaningful ways that we're seeing companies take action and inform the customers uh, without being uh, overly scary. So here's our first example. Subject line was inactive account cleanup. And they sent to this customer saying, hey, it looks like your account for this email address hasn't been active for a, a while. In 60 days, we're going to delete you. But hey, do you not want us to delete your account? No problem. Here are the steps you can take to ensure that we continue to keep your information and you continue to use the service. Here's another example. Dear user, we're writing to let you know that we have some new policies for how long we're storing data. Let's summarize those policies. If you're inactive for two years in any of these products, then we might delete that content for the products in which you're inactive. If you don't want us to impact you, so now we move to the what this means for you, this is only for people that have been inactive by this date for this amount of time. And so we're letting our customers know, if you don't like this, here's what you can do to take action. Our sixth tip is to auto schedule periodic audits to confirm your policies and making sure that they're being enforced. Now this includes your retention periods, but it can be any policy that you have. Uh, it could be the who can access certain types of data or who it gets shared with, et cetera. The important thing is to, similar to uh, reevaluating your uh, engagement over time, you're going to want to 
continue to reevaluate and check in to make sure that whatever it is that you determine is actually happening. So let's recap with some tips for staying lean. If you don't need it, quite simply, don't collect it in the first place. And if you don't need it anymore, then remember to get rid of it. And if your customers are no longer engaged and they haven't used your product for a long period of time, consider removing them. And then lastly, identify those specific areas for periodic review, also known as an audit, uh, to ensure that your established policies are being followed. Our third and final principle is building security. And that one is about protecting the data that you have. So we're seeing the issue of data breaches all over the world, right? Even in India, as of November, India was seeing 37% increase in data breaches and cyber attacks that were happening. So we all know that when we talk about security and data protection and data uh, breaches, it's not a matter of if, but when, unfortunately. And so hopefully these tips, if they're not ones that you're already using within your organizations, are ones that you can apply so that you can reduce the risk to your business and your brand. Our first tip is to plan for security in advance. So you're going to want to consider security from a strategic level first. And then of course, you're also going to want to have the specific things that will help strengthen your, your company and your system. So what do we mean by, th by this? What I mean is work with subject matter experts to build in things like ethical hacking and penetration testing uh, into your processes so that you are able to test out how secure, how strong your systems are, rather than finding out first through a malicious actor. You're also going to want to have an incident response plan so that you are prepared in the event a data breach or data incident does happen. You don't want to be figuring out who it is that you should be bringing in to the situation in the middle of an incident. You want to have a documented plan so that if unfortunately it happens, you know exactly what to do. Here's an example of another policy that you're going to want to uh, incorporate from the beginning. And that's around data governance and thinking about who can access data, who can handle data and in what manner is uh, the is data okay to be handled within your organization? Having these types of policies are really helpful for your employees to understand what's expected of them and what the guidelines and guardrails are for them so that everyone is comfortable that they're in compliance with uh, expectations. Our second tip is to secure data at every stage. And what we mean here is securing data throughout the data life cycle. So when I say secure data, I'm talking about using physical, administrative, and technical security measures. And when I say data life cycle, I'm talking about from the point that data is collected to how you're using the data, who you're sharing it with, how long you're holding on to the data, and of course, ultimately deleting the data at the end of that life cycle. So you're going to also want to keep in mind that if you're sharing data with third parties, for, exa for example, vendors or business partners, they should also be following these same expectations, this same security throughout the data life cycle. And so, of course, it's important to choose vendors and business partners that align with your expectations on security and privacy so that everyone stays on the same page. So some examples for securing 
uh, your data throughout the data lifecycle include, of course, encryption. And that's both encryption in transit as well as encryption when the data is at rest. For physical security, uh, in the event you're in an office, for example, you're going to want to use uh, ID cards and badging and making sure that there is that physical security to ensure that just anyone can't just access your physical property and potentially the data that resides there. Uh, for administrative controls, an example there are your access controls. You know, not every employee should be able to access all types of data. Um, different people should have access based off of what their specific role is. And you will want to make sure that your systems are designed with the access controls in mind. And then uh, some examples on the technical security side, I already mentioned uh, encryption. We already talked about penetration testing. One other one could be the vulnerability reporting and we'll talk about that shortly as well and uh, transparency through vulnerability reporting. Our third tip is to require strong authentication and authorization. It's not an uncommonly known fact that humans are often the weakest link when it comes to data incidents. And so because of that, we're going to make, we're going to want to make sure that there is strong security, especially for the administrative level uh, privileges and access that your systems have. So think of it as you know, those elevated privileges or keys to the kingdom, uh, you know, making sure that you're using things like multi-factor authentication and sh even stronger security for um, the more sensitive systems or the systems with access to a lot of data. Now, you're also going to want to think about it from your customer's perspective and making sure that the authentication that they're providing to your service is strong as well. And so it's we are seeing more and more that companies are also requiring their customers to use multi-factor authentication to use their service. So not only their email address, but also providing a, a code that gets sent to them, for example, that the customer then puts in before they're able to access the service. And as I said earlier, unfortunately, these things inevitably happen. And this is an example from Firefox back in 2015. Ha anyone was able to essentially access a list of our unpatched uh, bugs within Firefox. So while they were not the most sensitive bugs, they were still unpatched, meaning that it was a vulnerability that, if known, could be exploited. And this was before we were using multi-factor authentication within that bug program. And so it's one example of the benefits of multi-factor authentication for your product or service. And speaking of bugs, our fourth tip is to have a bug bounty program and to manage and report product security issues and fixes. So Mozilla has a bug bounty program, and it's an opportunity for essentially anyone who spots a vulnerability to report it to us. And uh, based off of what it was that they report, we do compensate uh, those bug reporters, which incentivizes folks sometimes uh, to want to help us improve and uh, find the vulnerabilities and resolve them. Being transparent about your vulnerabilities to the greater community is also very important. And it's something that uh, we do as well. So sometimes we might think we are exposing our weaknesses by sharing the vulnerabilities that we found and fixed. And by we, I'm saying it as you know any of us with any organization, 
but really it shows transparency and continuous improvement because we all have to update our operating systems and our apps and other things to um, resolve specific vulnerabilities sometimes. And so it's expected that, you know, no company is perfect and that there are always new things coming out. And so by being transparent, you're again, building trust in your brand and be and helping your customers and the community to understand that you are constantly working on improving and strengthening and getting better. So let's recap with some tips for building security. First, determine how your data will be protected throughout the data life cycle. So remember, that is from the moment the data is first collected up until the end of the life cycle with data deletion. Secondly, choose partners and service providers who will handle the data securely and in alignment with your business expectations. You could be the most privacy centric secure company in the world, but if you are partnering with other organizations that do not see your vision and do not share the same ethos around privacy and security, then these companies that ultimately have your data can ultimately tarnish your brand. And then lastly, when issues do arise, communicate those security mitigations clearly to the public that builds trust through that transparency and ultimately can uh, help your brand. So I'd like to leave you with leandatapractices.com, our website that you can access at any time to get a variety of resources on our LDP framework and how you can apply it at your organization. We also have there a downloadable LDP toolkit. This toolkit is full of so many different artifacts that you can use to apply different tips and principles um, working with other stakeholders at your organization to start to build out what application of LDP looks like in your specific context. So thank you everyone for your time today. Hope you are able to take a few things out of this that you can immediately start applying with the flexible framework that is Lean Data Practices. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Noemi Hailu and I am the Africa Innovation Emirati Program Manager at Mozilla. Thank you for including me in this exciting event and I'm sorry that I can't join in live time, but I'm delighted to take part and give a quick update about something that Mozilla has developed around the lean data practices. You've just heard my colleague Neka give a wonderful and detailed overview of the LDP framework and some practical examples of how it can be applied. Um, and with NECA's leader, under NECA's leadership, we actually created a course that elaborates on the LDP framework and is available online for free on the Udemy platform. It's just under two hours. And we are really excited to share and disseminate what we consider to be a very useful resource that takes the content that NECA was just speaking on and allows users to go through it at their own pace. This partnership with NECA and the Lean Data Practices and the Africa Emirati, which I work on, is part of Mozilla's Reimagine Open Initiative and the Africa Innovation Emirati, which is Kiswahili for program for the Africa continent. It's Mozilla's first self-paced LDP course, and it was tailored for the startup and entrepreneur community, especially those with little knowledge around privacy and security concepts. But many of the lessons and learnings in the course are applicable regardless of the size of your organization, your industry, or your geographical location. So the course dives into how you can apply the LDP framework in your own area of expertise. We have a series of interviews with Mozilla staff and um, outside experts, as well as using case studies throughout to highlight real life applications of the LDP concepts. You can take a look at the course by visiting this website right here. And to give you an idea, 
the course is broken down into seven different sections and each of those are further broken into some subsections that allows you to really pause, take in the learnings. And we also link a number of resources, some toolkits and worksheets throughout so that you can practice with some uh, applicable homework throughout the course. And just to give you a little flavor now, I'll play a brief teaser trailer of the course. It was very exciting to bring the content of LDP to life through some fun graphics and animation. So here's a look at the LDP course. Lean Data Practices or LDP is a flexible framework that anyone can use to advance privacy, security, and innovation in their organization. It is useful for anyone with access to personal data, whether that data is for consumers of your technology or your employees. This course will dive into how we can apply the Lean Data Practices framework in the startup and innovation space with a focus on technology-based products. You will learn about LDP concepts as they relate to different companies through various case studies throughout the course. We are currently actively promoting the course. We're starting in Kenya and East Africa and going with some direct engagement with startups and entrepreneurs, as well as partnerships with academic institutions to include the course in their curriculum. Um, and we're also interested in working with regulators, regulatory bodies, and multinational institutions because we believe that this would be a useful resource, not only for policymakers to have a better grasp around these issues, but also for their employees and their constituencies. So with that, we would love to get the privacy mode community involved. Um, you can reach out to me at my email address right here or the LDP at mozilla.com email address. Um, if you have any questions, we're also really interested in partnering and having special events with groups uh, around this content. And so we'd love to hear from you if you have any ideas around that. Of course, uh, we are asking for you to take the course. We think that it's something that is very helpful. And, and again, it's a very useful and applicable resource. Um, and we'd love to, to know what you think. Leave us a comment. You can comment directly on the course or reach out by email, but we would love your feedback in particular because we see this as the first instant of something that can be tailored to specific audiences or revamped down the line. And so we would love to hear from you what you found interesting or in particular, how you think that we could improve upon the course. And finally, please share this widely across your networks. And thank you once again very much. I wish you a wonderful rest of the event and a wonderful day.